for logging in. To okay, thanks, Teresa, for starting the recording. <laughs> and I apologize, I'm still getting over the last of the cold. Um, my name is Dolores Davison. I teach history and women's studies at Foothill College, and I am a statewide academic senate for California Community College's appointee to the California Open Ed Resources Council. Um, and I'm joined with, by Cheryl Aschenbach, who teaches English at Lassen College and is another appointee from the ASCCC to the Council. And this particular webinar is specifically about the professional development surrounding OER and the professional development for colleges that wish to pursue the incentive monies that are provided by AB 798. And so what we're going to do is go through the toolkit that was just released last week um, and uh, basically talk through the types of things that you would be looking at um, in terms of professional development on your campuses and professional development around the adoption of OER. And welcome, uh, R. Oxford. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, we've got library faculty on board because uh, this is something that we're going to be seeing a lot of. Our, our third member that's been um, appointed to the council, Dan Crump, is also a librarian. So he's been great about bringing the library perspective in and ensuring that the library faculty are uh, well represented when it comes time to talking about the different things that we would be doing. Uh, with OER and with the AD uh, 798 monies and, and those sorts of things. Um, so as you can see, the toolkit basically starts off with a brief introduction. Um, toolkit 1, which is available on the Cool for Ed website and which can be linked to from this particular uh, webinar uh, toolkit, um, began with sort of <laughs> the orienting uh, faculty, administrators, staff, and students to OER and what we would be doing uh, what they were looking for, writing a proposal, and so on. And the second toolkit is more designed to help campuses formulate their plans, um, ensuring that they have all of the elements in place for the plans, and then crafting things like faculty development workshops um, and looking at the use of OER in classes uh, and the like. Uh, ADA compliance is part of this as well, and the sustainability of OER adoption plans and ensuring, thank you, Teresa, ensuring that um, the plans are sustainable going forward and that this isn't something that just dies on the vine at the campuses. Um, in addition, one of the other links that is in that introductory paragraph uh, is a white paper that the council wrote, uh, largely written by Ruth Guthrie from CSU uh, Pomona. Um, is she at Cal Poly Pomona or CSU it's the Pomona? Same. Is it the same campus? Okay. Um, and she wrote that with the help of the rest of the council, members of other members of the council, um, talking about uh, the surveys that we had done with faculty and students about OER uh, and the work that the faculty in the original pilot project had done, um, issues they had run into, concerns that they had, and the like. So we've got a variety of different resources available to faculty and to colleges that are interested in pursuing the AB 798 monies uh, and that are interested in bringing OER to their campus. So the first part of the toolkit uh, is a pair of workshop formats about how to use OER uh, and showing how OER is possible on campuses. Um, the first one, the Wiki Educator one, is a little shorter. It's more of a checklist with some very specific elements. The second one, the Immersion Training, is a very lengthy um, and detailed format for doing uh, projects on campus. Uh, that is a little more difficult, I think, to undertake, especially at the community colleges. Um, a a three-day workshop is, is a little more of a struggle, but um, either of these provide a tremendous amount of professional development around what we're doing with OER, what other campuses and other systems have been doing with it, uh, and to get an idea of how open educational resources can be integrated into the campus uh, life and into the campus um, culture. 
And then the second part of the toolkit, which is the far more beefy and far more extensive portion of the toolkit, are a series of topics about professional development, around professional development, and workshops around these topics in understanding and using OER materials. And it focuses a little more specifically on textbooks because AB 798 has a very specific textbook focus. Um, OER typically is defined as a variety of different things. They can be um, course sites, they can be class content, they can be a variety of uh, different kinds of materials that are all open and available. But 8798 and the previous uh, legislation, SB 1052 and 1053, focused pretty exclusively on textbook adoption and textbook use, um, viewing that as, in most cases, the single largest cost uh, for students taking courses in terms of materials. Now, at the community colleges and in courses that are more career technical education, voc traditional vocational courses, um, we've seen that a lot of times the materials are more expensive than the textbooks because of what they're required to purchase. Um, we At Foothill, we have a dental hygiene and dental assisting program, and the materials that the students have to purchase uh, uh, add a significant cost to the cost of that program, and most of them are not available as open educational resources. But for most of our traditional transfer courses, um, for some CTE programs, especially in areas like child development, the textbook costs are significant, and the 8798 monies are designed to help faculty begin to look at alternative uses of texts and alternative options for students uh, that would save them monies going forward. And if you're not familiar with 8798, there are links to it in Toolkit 1. Uh, the language is actually up on the Cool for Ed website that Teresa has posted in the chat. And that contains information not only about the um, RFP for the incentive monies that are going to be uh, determined over the summer. Those applications are due June 30th. Uh, but it also contains a tremendous Im amount of information, including the links to the textbooks that have been <laughs> reviewed um, by faculty in the three different systems in the CSU, UC, and at CCCs. Uh, and so there's a variety of different things there that uh, you can take a look at if you're interested in specific OER materials. And they are uh, broken down on the Cool for Ed site by uh, discipline so that you can specifically look up, I'm interested in a child development text, and you can pull up child development and look at the texts that are available. So the first part of the professional development workshop topics here, letter 1A, are specific OER starter kit information. Um, the myth busting is probably the most interesting of these, and we're going to see if my links actually work. Ah, they do. Fabulous. Um, so this is actually a really, really helpful uh, sheet, and I know that our student, uh, the Student Center for the California Community Colleges has been using this um, because it breaks down some of the myths that they're not sustainable, that it's too difficult um, to adopt. Uh, I particularly like that our forcing internationalization and common core standards. Uh, there are a variety of different myths that this breaks down, and it's an easy graphic. Um, some of these myths, I think, are grounded a little bit in reality. Um, I certainly think that any time you change a textbook, you need time to do that. Um, and so there are a few of them that have some truths. Um, but certainly the idea that OER can't be produced professionally, we know that's not true. Um, and we know that having looked at the reviews for the texts that were brought to our attention in the first part of 1052 and uh, SB 1052 and 1053, there are um, very high quality materials that are being produced under OER uh, that are, are very solid. And that also takes care of this OER myth that unverified materials being used. Uh, one of the things that the Cool for Ed website provides with the reviews, uh, in addition to reviews of textbooks that were well reviewed and, and well received, there are also textbooks and other materials that are loaded up that were not reviewed but that have problems or that have issues. 
Um, my personal favorite is that one of the books that uh, is one of the sites that is listed as an OER material um, is a collection of essays by high school students about European history, and that's listed as an OER material for European history. So the myth, this particular handout um, is a really great starting point in terms of talking about OER uh, and in terms of discussing sort of what OER uh, is or isn't and how it affects uh, faculty and the different changes that uh, that would bring about if you were using that. So the first part of this is the OER, how it works, uh, that sort of thing. And then the second part here, the open textbooks, um, contains both uh, pedagogical uh, studies of how adoption of textbooks impacts students at post-secondary institutions <laughs> and some really um, uh, quality sort of basic information about the open textbooks that were reviewed. If you look, for example, at the peer-reviewed, uh, the rubric that we used for guiding or for, for reviewing the textbooks uh, that was used by the members that were uh, designated, and the, the members who were chosen to review textbooks were vetted in the community college system by their academic senate presidents, and uh, they were named to review. They received a small stipend for each text they reviewed. Um, but the actual rubric itself is fairly, as you can see, fairly detailed and fairly extensive and provide, uh, provides a tremendous amount of opportunity for each of the faculty who reviewed the text to provide information about what they liked, what they didn't like, um, and areas that they had concerns about. And if you go through any of the reviews on Cool for Ed, you'll see that the faculty were not shy about talking about things that they didn't like, things that they thought were inferior, um, things that they thought should be changed. They were, they were pretty blunt about those sorts of things. So this second part here um, sort of goes through what open textbooks are, what, how they can be reviewed, how they can be evaluated, um, and then some general information about looking at the impact of open textbook adoption. We have a lot of anecdotal information about that, um, and not just using OER, but using, uh, for example, being on campuses where m multiple editions are allowed to be used so that faculty can choose, <coughs> excuse me, an older edition of the text at a lower cost or where they choose um, the sort of rough and ready version of the text versus the shiny uh, color photo one. So there are a variety of different ways that uh, cost savings can be achieved, but this particular section on why using open textbooks is a good idea or, you know, how those are used uh, is very, very helpful. And then the second part here for professional development is about building a community on your campus of faculty and administrators and staff and students, which is very, very important. Um, that know about open ed resources and are interested in participating in them. Um, and a couple of these uh, are particularly interesting in the context of using open ed resources in particular fields. Um, Portland Community College has done a tremendous amount of work on this. Oregon is way, way ahead on OER. And so they, they have been very engaged in these discussions about how to use OER, um, ways to get people involved and interested. Uh, one of my friends who teaches at Lane Community College up in Eugene said that there was uh, at one point almost a public shaming if you were still using publisher materials that were not OER because you were charging your students more money than you know, than anything else. That was ridiculous. Um, and this particular student and, and faculty survey, the templates that are here that are listed under 2A2, um, those are the templates that were used to help construct the white paper that I referenced earlier. And they surveyed, we had 16 faculty that participated, um, several hundred students who were involved in the experiment, uh, or pilot, um, and the pilot asked faculty to adopt anywhere from one chapter of an OER text to an entire text, uh, and they did a variety. There were some faculty who adopted a chapter or two. 
most of the faculty adopted most or not, uh, if not all, of the OER textbook as part of their class structure. And uh, they surveyed the students and the faculty both uh, after they had used it. The students were given a survey about whether they thought the materials were equal, whether they were better. Um, and the, the open ed materials were available in two formats. They could be downloaded as PDFs and they were available as web books. Uh, and there were some issues with each of the different types. Um, but for the most part, the students were enthusiastic about the reduced cost. Um, there were a few questions that were asked in the survey that we realized afterwards um, probably weren't as helpful as they could have been, particularly the one asking whether the quality was equal to regular textbooks that would have been uh, provided by a publisher. Most of the students wouldn't know that necessarily. but. Um, so the white paper covers the results of those, but if you're interested in having faculty, for example, survey their students about um, what their experiences were using that, um, this can be modified uh, and used, uh, you know, to survey the students once you've done it. It's about four pages, five pages. Um, and it's pretty much all multiple choice. There's a little, uh, the very bottom is, is comments that are optional. But um, so you can kind of get an idea of whether or not the students liked using the OER and what they liked about it. Um, the one complaint that, you know, frequently comes up is not having a print copy. And that's possible with OER that you can print them out uh, and have copies at the bookstore and at the library. And I believe you would need to do that to meet ADA compliance. Um, right, Cheryl, we've talked about that. So, yeah, so we've got, you know, all of that information. And then marketing strategies and um, sort of how-tos with social campaigns. Um, social media is so crucial now. We have the, the, the Council for Open Ed Resources co-work has a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. Um, we're involved in discussions. Uh, Kathy Harris, the chair from San Jose State, is involved with discussions with folks all over the world. So uh, it's very interesting to see how far out this is, is being stretched. And we attended a conference in Vancouver in uh, November, and there were people reporting on OER use from Japan, from all over Canada, from England. Um, so there's tremendous interest worldwide about this. In fact, uh, two of the members of the council, and I'm not saying this with any envy at all, total envy, um, are attending a conference later this month in Poland to talk about what we've been doing in California. <clears throat> and the success of this particular movement, if it uh, ends up being as successful as we hope it will be in California, uh, will be, you know, we are the largest educational system, post-secondary educational system. And when you think about just the CSUs and the CCCs, <coughs> we've got 136 campuses between the two of us. So. Um, and, and 8798 only covers the CSUs and the CCCs. The UCs are not included in 798. So huge system, 2.3 million students served in 2014-15 by the community colleges. Um, enormous amount of people that can be touched by this. And so marketing strategies and involvement that way would be very important. The next section, um, section three here, the discipline specific sections, um, specifically talks about the discipline communities. And the Merlot discipline community is particularly important here. <coughs> As you can see, there are all of the different discipline communities. And you can choose, we'll go to my own, <coughs> excuse me. And this has all kinds of information about um, materials by category. You can look in very specific areas. You can look in more general areas, just resources. <coughs> it has access to all of the professional organizations. Um, and as you can see here, uh, a large group of faculty uh, joining every day uh, to be involved in this discussion about open ed resources um, and the opportunity to peer review materials that come through uh, that might be part of um, uh, OER if someone is interested in a particular discipline. <coughs> Excuse me, just a sec. Problem with talking too long. Um, mm, thank you. And then the curated collections under the OER Commons 
also provides um, specific information. The OER Commons and the Open Ed Resources um, Consortium has a tremendous amount of information on a variety of different types of topics. Uh, and as you can see, you can go through all kinds of different things um, and go to specific disciplines, take a look at specific examples. Um, these have ratings based on the faculty that have read through them. Um, some of these are very positive, some are very negative, some haven't been reviewed yet. Um, and so 500, or five, excuse me, 5,083 different possible sources. You can narrow it down into specific categories. Um, you can take a look at these different filters. As usual, world history is the lightest because that's always the case, but um, get an idea of the types of materials that are available. This is a Library of Congress material. So you can do discipline specific things. You can do larger research topics, those sorts of things in this particular set of materials. And then the fourth part here, the working with OER textbooks and materials, um, one of the things that we have had a lot of questions about is putting this into your local course management system. Um, the CCCs tend to use CMS, the CSUs seem to use LMS. We seem sort of interchanged, but um, being able to integrate an OER textbook into the course site itself, because most OER is available digitally. Uh, the ability to be able to put that in to allow students to download specific chapters, what they need, um, portions of the text, the entire text, however they want to do that. Um, and then the other possibility, and this is a really intriguing one, although it, there are, I think, some pedagogical issues, is the idea of remixing the textbook with OER materials. Um, one of the examples that we have in American history is a textbook that was written by a professor who's at Appalachian State University. And he, when he published his, and he used Flat World to publish his, so it's uh, about $10, I think, for a soft copy or for a hard copy. I think they've begun charging for the files, but it's, it's not excessive. Um, one of the keys about that was the ability for faculty to sort of pick and choose chapters that they were using. As a faculty member in Appalachia, he spoke at the um, Organization of American Historians, and one of the comments that he made was that it was very difficult um, to engage students in some topics, but they were particularly fascinated with topics that had to do with their local area, this localization. And so one of the things that he did was create an entire chapter on mining and the history of mining in Appalachia. Drew students in, very interesting. Probably wouldn't be something that in the San Francisco Bay Area would be as, of mu as much interest to the students here, but they might be far more interested in the gold rush. So there's some remixing, some adding things in that you want to add in, increasing them, um, those sorts of examples. And then these examples of teaching these two e-portfolios give some ideas of how faculty have linked um, OER to their courses and brought the uh, different types into um, their specific classes. And you can look at this, actually, Alice's is um, pretty interesting because she teaches this humanities course. She's down at West LA. And um, it's a, she's an art history faculty member, but she also teaches humanities, professor of humanities. So she's brought in all of these different um, videos into her, her classes and how she's done it. And then the textbook adoption um, and using smart history uh, in art history. And this is actually a really great, the smart history text is really good. Um, and so being able to talk about what she did, how that improved, sample assignments, rubrics, all of these different things. And so we have portfolios, and I'm sure that the number of portfolios will increase um, about how to use OER in your classroom um, and serve sort of as a, <coughs> a form of professional development for faculty who might want to take a look at this on their own. So that section, section four, specifically on the teaching, <coughs> um, shows some examples and some integration models and ideas for faculty to use. 
The next section, 4B, is specifically about learning. And there are a number of different things here that are really helpful for faculty that are looking to integrate OER. Some of them, as you can see for the first part here, are basically articles <coughs> published in a variety of different locations um, by a variety of different faculty about digital reading and importance of deep reading even when you're doing digital and so on. But <coughs> this particular um, uh, and I, this particular tutorial by Diego Bonilla, who is a member of the council with us, is fabulous. And it's a video tutorial um, in which he talks about basically how to use mind mapping and why to use these different types of reading and how <laughs> these textbooks or these print textbooks, digital textbooks, why electronics aren't for everybody goes through a tremendous amount of basically how to do these things. And this is an absolutely fantastic video. It's about half an hour. It's not too bad, um, not too long. But it's absolutely fascinating to talk about um, how this works and how to read on electronic devices. And so if you have an opportunity to read this, the interactive mind map is particularly interesting. Um, and so you can sort of build on this um, and see how this works, uh, reading on electronic devices, for example. And you can go into the whole discussion. I'll spare you listening to it. Um, but go through all of this. And this is brand new. Diego just published this about two weeks ago, I guess, um, for specifically for the council and for the toolkit. So tremendous resource, very, very interesting. Um, and really interesting even from a pedagogical standpoint of how reading works and how to do that. Um, there's also a whole section in here about how to annotate on a print co or a digital copy and annotating strategies. Um, and this can be applied to both uh, an online text as well as a hard copy text. Um, but just some really basic strategies about annotating a text and deep reading. Um, unfortunately, what I've noticed over the last few years is that our students don't seem to be getting that. Um, they're not being taught how to take notes. They're not being taught how to annotate when they read. And so these are very helpful strategies. I've actually um, uh, started using this one, the University of Texas El Paso one, in my classroom um, for students who are new to taking history and aren't used to annotating a text. Um, there's also some specifics here on digital annotation. Um, especially about using an iPod or an iPad and how to use that. Uh, one of the things that came out in the student survey was that uh, at least the students that were surveyed specifically in our cohort that were talked to uh, the co uh, community college students, I believe there are about 125 of them in the cohort, um, most of them said that they didn't have a laptop, that they did their reading on either a tablet or on a, a phone. And so being able to annotate on something like that is really going to be crucial if that's what you're sort of, um, what, what's happening with your students. So all of these different types of tools and how to do digital annotation. And then 4.3 is specifically, of, or 4A3 is specifically about social reading um, and about the significance of social reading and integrating that into uh, the reading that you assign in your classes. And then there's a whole section here on printing services for textbooks uh, that will work with your campus bookstore if you choose to adopt OER and will allow um, print copies to be obtained by students at little more than cost. The, the idea with OER materials is that the bookstore, the bookstore should be making uh, not really making a profit off of them. It should be the reasonable cost of what it would cost to have the textbook printed and then shelving costs, labor costs of putting it on the shelves and those sorts of things, not, you know, 40% markup on printing costs sort of idea. Um, and then 4B, 4, yeah, 4B, sorry, we, I think we misnumbered that one, um, is the survey instrument. Uh, again, the templates that we used for both faculty and students. And then the peer review uh, rubric, which you saw earlier as far as OER textbooks and what uh, the reviewers were using when they did the peer review, the peer evaluation of the OER textbooks. 
SB 1052 and 1053 had asked us specifically, had asked the council to identify the 50 most uh, subscribed courses between the three segments, the CSUs, the UCs, and the community colleges, and identify open ed materials for those courses. Um, and one of the struggles we found was that for some of those courses, uh, either the courses were not, the, the, they were subscribed, highly subscribed at two of the segments, but not at the third, or they were subscribed, but they were in different names. Um, and so, for example, there was no um, uh, business course, business sort of 101 at Davis because it was under agricultural economics. Um, and, and so those sorts of things became problematic. But the thing that became more problematic and that we discovered was that some of these courses that are hugely significant and transferred between the three systems and are hugely important to students um, didn't have open education materials available or what was available was really mediocre. And so we sort of scrambled and we're still having the last of the reviews come in uh, because there are still some courses that we're still looking for open ed materials. Uh, I found, we found out a couple of weeks ago that OpenStax is getting ready to publish an astronomy text, which will be the first one that has been published in open ed. Uh, it's being authored by Andrew Fracknoy, who's a, a community college faculty member in astronomy and uh, very well known in the astronomy field, and so uh, I'm hoping that that will be well received, but it will give another opportunity for a class that hasn't previously had any open-end materials available. It will have a textbook available. Um, and then the last part here, C and D, um, are specifically about two of the elements that the council is sort of tackling now. Um, the council just had a meeting on Monday to talk specifically about sustainability and what we do going forward. Uh, the monies for AB 798, uh, the monies for the council to even meet basically expire at the end of this school year, this academic year. And so what we're looking at is how do we have colleges jump on board and then make this a sustainable effort. If the monies are only available in a one-time incentive uh, to be awarded in fall of 2016, uh, there are potential bonus grants that would be available in 2018, but that assumes that all the money isn't gone by then. Um, but what do we do on the campuses and as with the council to continue to sustain these efforts, uh, to continue to push for the use of open-end materials? And then how do we ensure that those are accessible? And this is a really crucial point. Um, OpenStax is the only one of the publishers, for lack of a better word, um, and OpenStax is through Rice University, uh, they ensure that the texts that they publish and make available are accessible. That is not always the case. And many of the open ed resources that are floating around are in fact not accessible, and that becomes problematic, uh, not only from the obvious perspective of students not being able to access, uh, to, to use the texts if they're not accessible, um, but in terms of uh, placing that burden or that onus on faculty to then make their texts sustain, uh, accessible and, and what they should do and how they should do that. And so these criteria um, and the open ed, uh, the, the cool for ed accessibility re review criteria um, spells out very clearly uh, what the text has to have uh, in order to be considered accessible. Um, none of this should be of any particular surprise if you've done anything with accessibility. Um, you have to be able to change the fonts, you have to have the alt tags, you have to have multimedia transcripts available, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so those kinds of materials or those, those kinds of uh, issues uh, tie in to a certain extent to the sustainability part and they also tie into ensuring that whatever you choose to adopt or you choose to use meets the criteria for accessibility under ADA and under all of the other um, different, you know, rubrics that are provided. So that is kind of a step through, a very quick, uh, down and dirty step through of the OER toolkit and professional development for faculty, staff, uh, administrators, and 
students to a certain degree, at least training them on how to use OER and, and instructing them on why uh, faculty would want to switch to that. I know at the community college level, the students have been very eager, and in fact, in a number of campuses, including both my own and my sister college at De Anza, um, the students brought forward the resolution to the Academic Senate about adopting an OER plan. Uh, and so involving the students and, and having them engaged in these discussions is really important. In fact, it's a mandatory part of the plan that would be submitted by June 30th for the incentive grants, uh, for the incentive uh, monies, uh, that the students have to be consulted and have to be involved. So um, this sort of covers the professional development that is out there. We're adding to all of the materials on Cool for Ed and on the council website on a regular basis. Uh, we are in constant sort of email communication with each other about what's out there, what's new, what we've heard. Uh, and so the, the plan is going forward to, at least through the end of this academic year, continue those conversations. Uh, and then over the summer, the uh, members of the council who have agreed to read the incentive applications, the incentive money applications, will read through those. The monies will be, uh, the decisions will be made by the end of uh, I believe, Cheryl, it's September, end of yes. September, we have to have those decisions. Most likely yeah. to be in August, the but as late as September. To, yeah, and then they're hoping to have the monies distributed no later than, uh, they're hoping for October, the latest would be November 1st. Um, so the council will continue its work through the summer on that specifically. Um, but throughout all of that, we'll continue to look for additional materials, additional opportunities for faculty, staff, students, administrators, uh, and continue to engage in these conversations. There are a series of presentations that are going to be occurring. Uh, we are doing a breakout at plenary in two weeks. There is a breakout at the online teaching conference. Uh, there is a breakout at the CTE Leadership Institute um, in May uh, down in Anaheim. Uh, and so there will be uh, lots of materials out there and lots of professional development opportunities. Uh, through the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, through the Affordable Learning Solutions Group at, at CSU, uh, all kinds of different things out there in terms of professional development for faculty that are interested in using OER. So Cheryl, do you have anything you want to add? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it well. Thank you. Um, so. <clears throat> Any idea where to find folks that can bring on campus to lead workshops, specifically how to redefine courses? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we are working on right now at the statewide academic senate level is that we found we formed a, um, and I should I should say, and I'm sorry I didn't say this in the introduction. Cheryl and I both serve on the executive committee for the statewide academic senate, uh, and so we report directly back to that body as well. And in January, we formed a task force specifically on OER. And I am chairing that task force. Cheryl is my second on there. And we are working with the uh, Community College League of California, which represents the trustees and the CEOs, uh, and with the Student Senate for a variety of different things um, in terms of how we want to move forward with OER at the community college level. And one of the things that uh, did come up was talking about how to get the word out to campuses. And so one of the ways that we could do that is specifically to look at um, redesigning courses and, and doing workshops on that. And I think that the plenary session that we're, um, Cheryl, you're not doing that with me. I think that's myself and Dan Crump doing that in a couple of weeks. Um, that will be one of the topics that we'll be specifically looking at. Because one of the keys about using OER um, is that it should be similar in a lot of ways to redesigning your class when you change your textbook. Uh, it, it shouldn't be, you wouldn't necessarily have to completely redo your course structure. Uh, more so in an online class where you would be integrating the elements of the text into the CMS. Um, but there are definitely things that you might do differently or that you would do differently if you used OER. And so that would be something we could talk about with the task force going forward um, about having even a series of regional meetings to talk about using OER. 
Uh, we do have our online education regionals this weekend, but that is not a topic that will be on there, but that's a really good suggestion. Uh, and I would suggest sending an email <coughs> to um, info at ASCCC at ASCCC.org um, and asking about uh, that sort of a not quite technical visit, but a specific visit about that. We have faculty to, that go to campuses to talk about curriculum development. We have about non-credit, a variety of different things. So that would definitely be a possibility going forward. That's a really good idea. Cheryl, anything you can think about that? I think you can also reach that? out to the um, OER Council or OER uh, Consortium. Oh, that's true. Yeah, the OER, the CCC OER consortium is also a really good wor uh, uh, resource. And Cheryl, do you have that email or their their website? Give me a moment. I'll, I'll confirm it before I tell you what it is. Okay. Yeah, um, they do a lot of professional development as well, uh, all over the place, and they were. Um, uh, created up here, actually, at, at Foothill De Anza, our former chancellor, Martha Cantor, was very interested in OER, and so she um, put her money where her mouth was, basically, and put up funds to create this council, and since then, they've morphed off, and they're separated from us, although one of the directors, one of the people that's helping to lead the efforts is a former staff member here at, at FHDA. Um, but they are doing a lot of uh, workshops and things like that as well. And so if you check out their website, um, they also have a variety of different people available and a lot of good information. And, and if you get on there, if you've got faculty that are really interested, they do have a listserv. Um, and so people are constantly posting things about, you know, I'm interested in a textbook on public communication and does anybody have a good one? Or I'm interested in changing this in my class. Does anyone have suggestions? And uh, several of the consortia are outside of just California. Uh, there are a number of them that are international. And so you'll get things from, hey, up in Saskatchewan, we're doing this. And so there's a lot of really interesting information out there. There are a lot of people getting on board with this. It's becoming um, more and more of a topic for faculty to talk about pedagogically. Um, and that's Una, uh, Una's email address. She is, uh, for the OE consortium, she's the, I believe her title is director now. Um, and so if you'd like to, you know, if you have faculty that are interested or staff that are interested that want to join the listserv or get more information, Una is definitely a great resource. I think, too, the listserv could be a resource not just to tap into the resources that the OER consortium has, but to even just ask colleagues if they know of anyone mm -hmm. that could do some peer-to-peer -peer type um, development. Or yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. So there's quite a lot out there. Yeah, and, and it's, it's pretty exciting. It's an exciting time to be involved in it. It's an exciting time to be talking about it. Um, <laughs> And we've also seen, and, and this would impact the community colleges, uh, there is interest in creating something along the lines of a Z degree, uh, like Tidewater in Virginia has introduced, uh, where the, the students would be able to uh, complete a degree. And we're actually arguing that it could be a certificate as well, rather than just a degree, but without incurring any textbook costs uh, or with minimal textbook costs. So the, the governor is very interested in that as well. And, at the uh, plenary session, that'll be one of the other topics we're going to be working on. So, yeah, you guys are working on one. Um, is Kelly Fowler your VPI at West Hills? I'm trying to remember who your VPI is because somebody was talking about College of the Canyons is doing it and West Hills, and there's somebody else. There were three. I can't remember who the third one was that are really engaged in it. I think Kelly's at Clovis. Is she, okay. Yeah, I think you're right. I couldn't remember. I, 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 they're all, they all move around too much. I can't keep track anymore. Um, but yeah, I, if you have any other questions, um, you can, if you, you, if you have questions specifically about some community college things, that info at ASCCC.org uh, email goes straight to our uh, executive director and her team, and it will be uh, any emails basically about anything with OER get forwarded to me. So 
or to Cheryl, depending on which one of us is less busy at the time. Um, so feel free to email if you have any questions or anything specific that, you know, comes up. Anything else, Cheryl? No worries. Okay, well, I think we're all finished. So, Teresa, thank you very much for your technical support. You are fabulous as always. Couldn't do any of this without you. And uh, we will continue these conversations. Thank you so much.